Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Psalm TV podcast. My name is Jason Wise. Really glad to have you with us. On today's episode, I'm going to speak with Sara Beer. She is the owner of True North Wine Merchants, and they import some of the greatest, lesser known Italian wines I've ever had, honestly. I think when you drink wines from Europe or Australia or, you know, Canada, if you're in the United States or if you're in those, uh, any other country, if you're bringing in wine, it's really a misunderstood thing of how the hell it gets there. What's the process? And it's very fascinating to talk to Sara because they're a smaller boutique importer. They have to really outthink the big guys. And so it's a fascinating conversation for those of you who drink wines that are not from the country that you live in. She's also the wife, I should say, the better half of Jonah Beer, who's been on this podcast many times, is all over Som TV, one of the funniest humans I've ever met. So if you've seen their blind tasting sessions where the two of them blind taste against each other, it's really really hilarious. And if you haven't, you need to watch that on some TV because they're the best. Before that, I want to remind you, we have new episodes of our brand new cooking and wine pairing competition show Sparklers every single week. And it builds to a finale that you guys, I cannot stress how wild this is. It just goes, it just goes ways none of us could have ever predicted. It's just wonderful stuff. And uh, if you're looking for a Christmas gift, somtv.com, you know, you, uh, you, you late buyers, for Xmas gifts, Hanukkah gifts, anything you're trying to buy for somebody, somtv.com is available. $49.99 for the entire year. You can gift it. It is a great decision. Next year, we have some incredible stuff coming, including our Judgment of Paris film, the fourth Psalm movie. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying that. And much, much, much more. Go to somtv.com and uh, get one of the, I think, the best gifts you can give somebody in the culinary world. Without further ado, my conversation with the great Sara Beer. Sara, it is an honor to have you on the Sound TV podcast. I'm not entirely sure why you agreed to this because um, I'm gonna I'm gonna come at you hard here. I am ready, and Jason, I'm, it's an honor to be on here. I know you've had my crazy husband Jonah on a few times, and he is a, the character of all characters. And I think the two of you have so much fun together. So I hope to hope to add some color to it. Yes, I think uh, just just to put listeners up to speed, Jonah Beer, if you don't know who she's talking about, uh, we just did our podcast with Wine Cameos where we talked uh, after having way too much wine about Top Gun for about 40 minutes. And uh, he's a former Mennonite. And we did that whole podcast about, <laughs> about uh, you know, he's he's a constant on Som TV and also, uh, you know, live right now, you can watch his new tasting notes where he talks about uh, Barolo, which is... You know, old style, new style, very intelligent guy. But I have this, I have this sneaking suspicion that you are actually the real brains behind this, uh, this team. Can I try to intro you? I'm going to try to do this. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So you and Jonah, Jonah was at Frog's Leap for a long time and you have been in the wine business for quite a long time, yes. right? I am so impressed with what the two of you have accomplished and you are a wine importer and we're going to, that's mainly what this podcast is going to be about. But also, you guys have your wine company, Pilcrow. Yeah. So let's take just a couple minutes and talk about, because you are not as upfront like Jonah is. I mean, Jonah's is uh, somebody who a lot of people in Napa Valley know, a lot of people in the wine business know because he's a wine rep. Yep. Let's talk about your career in the wine business. How did it start? Yep. Where did you come from? I guess we can touch on why the hell you married Jonah. But but uh, let's let's talk about, like, you know, how did you get into this? Because I yeah. think... The importation of wine is something I don't know much about. And it is a fascinating, fascinating world. So where did you start? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny because I think people think of Jonah as kind of the ultimate extrovert. And I would say I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not quite as extroverted as him. But I think when when we're together, it seems like I'm really quiet and shy. But if you're in sales, if you're in wine sales, you have to be pretty brave and and out there. It just is funny that I just happened to marry a man who just is so out there. <laughs> so I'm actually I'm actually pretty pretty loud myself and I think I make Jonah laugh even more than he makes me laugh. So it, we laugh a lot together. He's a really really funny guy, but I'm always doing prat falls and things to make him laugh as well. But uh, he and I, we both lived in the Napa Valley. I moved up when after we had met each other, but we both lived up here for over 20 years and uh, met in the wine business down in Southern California. For me, I grew up in Chicago, went to school on the East Coast, really wanted to do food, wine, and travel as my sort of vocation. Moved to LA, had a great opportunity to start working down in the sort of the West Hollywood area, but worked on the food side. So worked for a company called Jones on Third. That was my first job outside of college. And if you haven't been to Jones on Third, 
Great it's fried true. chicken sandwich. Amazing. Great, great, great fried chicken sandwich. I'm as soon as I that. start talking about it, I start to salivate and want to go there. But amazing family, the McNamara family, they invited me to come and work with them. I went to school with Susie McNamara, who's one of the daughters of Joan, along with Carol, her other daughter, and just had a great opportunity to work with them. They were starting to grow some of their businesses and loved every minute of it, loved living in L.A., but fell in love with wine, started to visit Santa Barbara Wine Country and got a great opportunity to work for a company called the Henry Wine Group, which is now owned by Winebow and was wine distributor company that really focused on education. And so I really got a crash course in wine in the, the first year that I worked there. They took a chance on me. I'd never sold wine before, but they saw that I was just this eager beaver. And they gave me an underperforming territory and said, go any store or restaurant with an ABC license in this whole area you can try and sell to. And so I just loved it. And Jonah was a rep for the California sales manager for Stag's Leap Wine Cellars, which was one of the wineries that was in the Henry Wine Group portfolio. And that's how we met. We met at a wine dinner and realized we were both from the Midwest and had a lot in common and eventually fell in love. And I moved up to the Napa Valley and worked for Franciscan, which is now Icon. And then my longest term incredible opportunity was with Duckhorn and worked for them for 13 or 14 years. And uh, they just have an incredible business model. They sell all their wines direct in the state of California. So it was great to be able to work on that team, selling to restaurants and wine shops and grow that team. So when I started there, there were two people on the team and we were able to grow the team to 17 salespeople in California. So my bailiwick has always been selling wholesale wine in California. And so when the opportunity came up to do it ourselves, that was kind of like our... We already you know, kind of knew that landscape. So it was exciting to try and do it ourselves. I think people... It's really important to hear that story because when we talk about how the hell you became a wine importer and how you became a, uh, it's not an overnight situation. You really put your work in. You and Jonah both, it doesn't really matter whether you're in Australia or New Zealand or South Africa. The wine business is one of connections. And I think it's important to hear the fact that you worked your way up for so long and now you get a chance to be broke again. (laughs) <laughs> having your own business. It's true. I mean, it's it, Jonah always <laughs> talks about like path to market and access to market that that's like the most important currency in the in the business or in 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 many industries, but in the wine business in particular. It's all about relationships with accounts, but also with, you know, peers in the wine industry and you definitely don't ever burn bridges in this business. And oh, I do. <laughs> Trust me. I can I can tell you I have uh, I have set a few buildings on fire, but oh somehow I'm still doing it. Oh my um, gosh. Well, but, I, I also yeah. want to I want to remind listeners that the blind tasting sessions you and Jonah do is hilarious and great and a lot of your story. And there's a lot of I don't want to spoil it, but you know, some of this is some of this is a part of of that blind tasting sessions, and really you should watch it. It's so fun. Any, anything with Jonah is worth watching, but when I think people were really happy to learn the other side of Jonah, who he married or who was willing to marry him, maybe is what I say. Yeah, um, it's it's funny. It's like, I think about, I don't know, Jason, if you found that with some of the other spouses that you've um, done the blind tastings with that Jonah and I, in the end, we have pretty similar tasting profiles, wines that we like, the ways that we sort of experience wine are very similar. And I don't know if that's something that just happened by happenstance, or if you you do get kind of a house palette together or exactly what happens. But it's fun. One of the things that I will say about importing is to start any business on your own is an incredible act of bravery. And there are wine importers that started just as one individual. And also there are several female, single female importers that do it on their own. But I have to say, it's a lot of fun to do it with a spouse or with a partner where you're kind of simpatico. So yeah, I think that that seeing the blind tasting, you kind of see how Jonah and I both experience wine and that I think we have a lot in common, although you know, I kicked his butt in that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I want to figure out, because this is a monster of a topic. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about importing wine. So your company is True North Wine Merchants, and you guys import wine primarily from where? I've had I've had a bunch of it. It's delicious. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we um it was important to us to explore the regions that we were most passionate about. And for many years before we did it, we decided that. Burgundy was a place that really felt like a beating heart for us. These are obviously very, very awe-inspiring wines, wines that evoke emotion. You know, most wineries there are family-owned and small production. They generally have, you know, a lot of the 
producers only have a handful of hectare of vineyards that they're working with. So, you know, we thought it was a great opportunity to, to tell fresh stories about a region that people know something about, but that there are producers there that, um, that hadn't been brought into California before. So it was a really cool to first start in Burgundy, a place that we got to know producers over a period of time. Um, and then when we got into it in 16, then we were able to, to start importing. But then Piemonte, which is the other region that we import from, was also calling to us, which is a place of great people. And Nebbiolo is sort of the, the primary grape, which is a awe-inspiring and heartbreaking grape um, that evokes a lot of emotion as well. Yeah, and, heartbreaking and, grape. Yeah, heartbreaking well, it's not, grape. it's not an easy grape to cultivate. and uh, no. But, but uh, it, it is also a grape that is specific to that region. It is very, very, it grows very well there and not very well elsewhere. There's a few places that are that are continuing to work with it, but it is a special place for it. And the people there are amazing as well. It's a very, but both of these are places where I think a lot of winemakers have had crossover to learning. They visit each other often, they've collaborated together. So there's a lot of symbiosis there. And so for us, it was those two regions that we felt like we got something interesting. Can I also say they're two of the most for lack of a better term, expensive wine regions. I mean, these are places that have watched the wines skyrocket. So here's, here's where I want to start with yeah. this importation of wine. Mm-hmm. So you made the decision we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure there is a 40-hour answer as to how you started. But what I'm curious about is, from a sky level, how do you pick the wines? And once you pick them, how do you convince them to let you import them? I mean, you guys are a small company. So how do you... Yeah. What is your, how, when you find a wine that's great, I mean, people listening to this, they know Barolo, they know Burgundy, and they know that those yeah. wines yeah. are oftentimes, you know, you're trying to find a deal and a deal is still expensive. Yeah. Okay. So just, just from a, from a region standpoint, how do you find a wine and how do you convince them to let you import it? Yeah. What is a, the, what is the process of this? That's a good question. I did want to dispel one of the myths from what you were just saying, which is that I think there's value to be found in every region. And there's definitely value to be found in both Burgundy and Piemonte. And that's taken a while for me to fully understand and also to to sort of share that message out in the market. But we can circle back to that in a second. No, um, no, no. Let's go. Let, no, let's, let's do that now. Okay. Let's do it now. Well, I mean, I, I I really do think that, well, I think that that learning about wine is, is sometimes overwhelming. I, I think that all of us feel, I, I'll speak for everybody who's probably listening and, and you and I, Jason, which is that we know it's a lifetime of learning, right? There's so much to continue to explore. I know several Psalms who disagree. They know everything. <laughs> they just know it all. Keep, They're just they know at the everything. Top. That's I it. won't name I won't name names, but I certainly could. Okay, keep going. So, you know, I just really think that there is, if you know what you're doing, there's great wine to be found at every price point. You don't have to spend a hundred dollars to get a great bottle of Burgundy, a great bottle of you know, Piemonte wines. I, it's it's interesting to learn sort of which wines to bring in and in, in what quantities because sometimes you'll be surprised that sometimes it's the sort of the most hard to get wine or the most expensive or most rare wine that gets people up in a tizzy. But sometimes it's a wine that just touches people, but that is retail, you know, retailing for less than $40. So, you know, I do think that there are great wines in that sort of $25 to $50 price range that, you know, maybe you're not drinking it every night, but they're wines that are deeply satisfying that are not, you know, super, super fancy. Are we talking about actual Barolo? Are you talking about wines that are from Lange or what, what are we talking about? Yeah, I, I do think that there are Barolos and Barbarescos that are still in that $50 retail price point that you can find. Um, but I, I also am talking about things like Lange Nebbiolo and Nebbiolo Dalba. I also bring in quite a few you know, Bourgogne Côte d'Or, Haute Côte de Beaune, Haute Côte de Nuit, all kinds of Côte de Nuit village, wines that are amazing and that I think should should be more, you know, could be more expensive. But, you know, that's that's just learning producer and learning the different parts of the regions that they're working with. And, you know, often we're purchasing in kind of a pyramid shape when we're, when we're wanting to support the producer throughout their line. We're not trying to cherry pick. We're trying, if it's a great producer and they're working with sites they believe in, there's going to be great wine in every part. And so we're bringing in wines that are not just Premier Cru or single vineyard Barolo. We're bringing in all the different pieces of the puzzle. So when you, when you go there and let, let's, let's uh, I guess, you know, the how you find a wine there's so much. I, I don't even know how to tackle that because that is subjective. It's luck. It's 
it's hard work. It's, it's so many things that I couldn't even possibly know to that you, that you do as your job. But let's say you find the wine. Let's say you are in Barolo or Burgundy, these places where they're not dummies there. They know what they're doing. They've made wine for a very long time. Oftentimes, the land's incredibly expensive. How do you convince them to let you bring their wine into the United States, which is, I'm assuming, a very important market for them? It is. And, and you know, one of the interesting pieces of it, though, is that New York, I think, is the, is the first place um, that is kind of seen as, you know, sort of the, the key market of the United States. But, you know, some of the more savvy producers know that California is very important and that there are, you know, five or 10 more markets that are super important. And sometimes the most innovative markets are, you know, up and coming that, you know, that they're, that they're open to. So, you know, sometimes we'll have a producer that we bring in where they, they're on the East Coast, but they've never been on the West Coast before. So there is an opportunity there. I'm, I'm glad to be an importer in California and maybe not New York because there, there's, there's opportunity with producers that might not have otherwise existed. But to answer your question, Jason, you know, I think that for both regions that we import from, a lot of what we have done is having someone that we know in the business introduce us. So somebody that perhaps knows that producer or is respected in the industry and that builds, you know, once you start to build your reputation, that continues to, to grow. But most of the work that we have done has been about third-party referral somehow, you know, someone putting in a good word for us. Um, but then, you know, you don't even really get the meeting. You don't really get to even taste with the producer unless you know, unless they've decided that they're at least open to talking to you. So, you know, you can't drop in and we get, we get no's often, you know, sometimes we'll taste a wine somewhere out in the world and we're just like, I'm so excited. I don't think they have an importer in California, you know, let's talk to them. And sometimes they just say, you know, we're full up that we don't, we don't have any more wine to open a new market. So, so there's some rejection on that end, but then on the other side, we're, when we're in those meetings and tasting, sometimes, you know, it's not a fit you know, often it's not a fit, you know, and sometimes that's because in the end, the, the, you know, it, it doesn't work for a million different reasons. And we can talk about that because in the end, as an importer, I have to be ready to go out there and tell the story and, and feel strongly about it. But also the wines have to be saleable, you know, they can't be too expensive in their price, you know, in their category, they can't, you know, they can't, they have to make sense because we're buying it all. It's all, you know, Jonah and I are financing it all to, to, to sell it. And generally we're, we're wanting to turn that over within a few months. You can't, you know, you can't just sit on wine for five years. Eventually the cash flow catches up. If Jonah would sell some of his scarf collection, <laughs> I think you'd be fine. You guys you think it's that valuable, Jason? <laughs> I don't, but I think he has enough that the bulk quantity is going to float you guys. Yeah. There are yeah. enough scarves. I don't know if anybody's watched Jonah ever on Sam TV, but the guy's a scarf king. It's amazing. Yes. Um, <laughs> so give me some stories. I mean, yeah. so when you go, yeah. when you go and meet some people, give me some stories of no's, yeses, some stories of awkward stuff. What is it like to go and do this whole thing? Yeah. I've been to these regions. Sometimes you show up and you're greeted by a goat, a chicken, and two dogs. And <laughs> yes. you're looking for a human and you can't find one. Yes. So that give does me some happen. Stories. That does happen. I mean, we've, and that's the thing is like Jonah is, much Jonah tends to be the person who does the, the the kind of the front work. You know, he identifies new producers that he thinks are interesting. So, for example, on our last trip, we went to visit one producer where it was just you know a young kid who's in his late twenties and he's out of you know he's just out of wine school and his family has a plot of land and that time we got there a little bit too early. You know, it was you know they they just they hadn't quite built out the winery. You know, there was construction equipment everywhere. He had skipped a vintage because of, you know, COVID or something like that. And it's just like, well, we're not there. You know, that that that's going to be way too confusing out in the market. But we like the kid. <laughs> we like his, we like what he's doing. So maybe two or three years from now, it's a good fit. But, you know, at the time it was just like, oh boy, we, we, this isn't perfect. And, and, uh, and it also, sometimes we, we think that we know what we're getting into and then we get there and, you know, we we had that experience on one of our last trips where it was like, you know, you walk in and, and you know, there's no story to the winery, you know, like they're making wine, but they're just like, there's nothing there. It's like you ask them probing questions. It's really important to ask. It's like, it's like dating or, you know. Like what, like what kind of probing questions? What do you ask them? Yeah. So like we named our company True North because we want to represent producers that have a True North, right? So 
like they can't be unlike you. They have to be unlike anybody else, right? So when you walk into a winery and they can't speak about what makes the vineyards they work with important, what what drives the way they farm, you know, what what decisions do they make on the winemaking side? Why do they make this wine? What's an interesting story about the producer? Like if they can't if they can't fill that out and if that can't be interesting, then like we can't, we're not even going past step one, you know? So, so there was a point we, Jonah and I had a meeting on this last trip where the very, like one of the very last meetings we took, it was, it was, you know, they were the nicest people, but I just like Jonah had to fill in the full conversation because I stopped taking notes. I stopped asking questions because they just weren't, they were making wine, but not with any really point to it. It was just a, you know, a business that didn't have passion behind it. That was, I'm assuming you were at DRC, right? For that meeting. <laughs> oh. uh, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's so interesting to think, I, I couldn't imagine there was any winery in these regions that would not have a story, would not have a, we care about the way things are farmed. That, that blows me away. But I yeah. also am very lucky to visit. We tend to be with people who are established. I mean, we're at a different end of where you're at. Yeah, you are... yeah. I mean, that's that's been a lesson we've had to learn, Jason, is that, you know, Jonah and I both worked for California wineries for so long that that a lot of they're thinking through the sales and marketing element of what they're doing, translating their story into selling points, into interesting stories, into like, what is what are the unique, interesting things about us? However, when you when my experience has been in Burgundy and Piemonte is that you kind of have to pull that information out of the producers. They know what they're they absolutely know what they're doing and they know why they're unique, but sometimes they don't know how to put it into a selling point that you can digest and, and hand out into the market. So that's been interesting. So there have been a lot of aha moments. Those those Jonah and I go and travel to Europe once a year. And it's very important to me to be very present in those meetings because if you ask a lot of questions, you're going to continue to pull out more information that helps you to sell that wine. So I have a lot of aha moments in those meetings where it's like, you know, they they're not going to put three bullet points and email it over to you. You have to, you know, you have to pull it out and figure and kind of figure out how you're going to market those wines. It's not something that comes in a PowerPoint to you. Well, I find you can't really know someone unless you've gotten drunk with them. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping you sit down and have some wine with them and yeah, yeah you know, I mean, get them. It's it's been really fun. Like that's been one of the most exciting things for us is to become friends with the producers that we work with, you know, and to be invited into their homes. So it's been really neat to this last trip. We just went to Piemonte because of COVID, so we couldn't go to both countries, and so. We went back to Piemonte and to have producers say, you know, come into our homes. You know, the kids are running around. They're showing us around the vineyards and their playground and, you know, all that. That's like when it's, you're just like, okay, this is, it's full circle. It's not, you know, again, you still have the business of wine and you still have to go out there and sell the wine. But at the end of the day, when you can kind of tell the stories of like breaking bread together and, you know, having a beer with that person and getting into trouble together somehow is, you know, that's, that's the fun of it. So, so yeah, we've had a lot of fun having meals together. And I think people in the wine industry, we like to eat and drink and it's been a really good experience. That's great. So when you, when you are doing this, how do you, it's always this, it's this crazy thing. If you were to take a winery, a tiny guy, somebody small, they have a very small, how many bottles are you importing? I guess we should ask. Like, for, and on average, what's like a really small producer? What's a large producer? For yeah, your I mean, I think we have one producer that is landing if if the ship ever arrives, and we can talk about stuff like that too. But <laughs> we have one producer that is it's two women. It's our first time importing them. Two women in their late twenties in Piemonte who are just making three wines, very small, um, and we're just bringing in twenty five six packs of their Longa Nebbiolo. So that's like you know. Wow. 12 nine liter units essentially. And that's how we'll launch them is that, you know, we'll identify some accounts that we, that are sort of, you know, telling new stories of Italian producers, um, whether that's an Italian restaurant or a wine shop and bringing in, you know, a small amount of their wine. So it's like, you know, pretty culty, I guess on that end. But then there are other producers that we're bringing in like three or 400 cases a year. But that's still pretty small, you know, in the, it is, yeah. in the, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, you know, we're, we're lucky that you can bring in less than a container of wines. So we can kind of stagger out our shipments and not have to worry about filling up an entire container, which, you know, for those of you that aren't in the sales um, side of things, you know, that a container is generally like a thousand to 1200 cases of wine. For us, we're small enough that 
it makes more sense for us to do, you know, little smaller bites of things. With some producers, we start small and we grow together over two or three or four years and kind of find the right sort of balance of things. Um, With other producers, they're just so small that, you know, there's one Burgundy producer, we get, you know, 30 to 40 cases a year from them, and that's all they can provide. And and they come and go within, you know, one or two months in the market. Right. Do you you have aspirations to be, I mean, I don't think people think of importers, a lot of people who buy wine, importers are not the star. You know, but for people who are wine people, you look at the importer. I mean, I know when I, when I got started and I made some, I remember meeting the team behind Rosenthal. Yeah. And I remember going, I really like these wines. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that little Rosenthal sticker on the back of a wine or the, on the label, I went, I'm probably going to like this wine. Yeah. I think for the, for the normal buyer of wine, that's probably not the way they approach stuff. Do you have ambitions to be known like a Rosenthal, Kermit Lynch, uh, you know, these importers who I'm sure started, not unlike you are starting right now, frankly. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it is important to us. We, um, Jonah just updated, uh, my husband Jonah just updated our logo for True North, which is, you can see on the back of, of uh, the label of all the wines we import now that it is a um, bear looking up at the North Star, and it's really, really cool. You know, iconic. Is the bear piece. wearing a scarf. Is there a scarf on the bear? <laughs> it might be hidden somewhere in the. You okay. know, it's just a white bear, so he might be I wearing a happily, white scarf. I will have your husband is a white bear. I'm happily. I will happily put the scarf on at my expense if you would like that to happen. Fantastic. So. Okay. Okay. I love it. Um, yeah. So so it's important to us to be the stamp of quality for. Um, the producers that we represent. I mean, I think that Kermit Lynch probably does it best in terms of, I think, some of their, or many, many of their bottles now have the Kermit Lynch logo on the front of the bottle, not even on the back, um, because it is such a stamp of quality. So that's really important to us. I think that, you know, for, for us, it's like, you know, I want... I want to be able to walk into an account and show wines that are from different producers in different regions, but that have, have someone, a buyer walk away and say like, okay, I get, I get that not all these wines taste the same and the stories are different and everything, but that, that there's kind of a through line of great quality and wines that have, you know, sort of depth to them, but also that, you know, yeah, like that there is this sort of like, you're not going to get clunkers with, with our portfolio. Um, and so that there's, there's some really nice um, sort of, I don't know, a true North, but like you, I think you'll find that the wines that we have tend to have a little bit more feminine quality to them. I don't think that that's unfair to say. I don't know, Jason, if you find that to be a, I don't know if that's a term that's fraught with issues. It is. I think when that term is brought up, oftentimes feminine, masculine is you find, okay, let's, let's, let's do this. I, like I think, uh, you know, in Piedmont, in Piedmonte, you hear feminine, masculine quite a bit. You mm-hmm. know, it's like the Barbaresco is this way, Barolo is this way. And the Langate Nebula is this way. And often feminine is a word. I will say in the, in the, I mean, you live in Napa, don't you? I mean, that's yeah. a word I think is not okay to use to describe wine normally. I, I think some people shy away from it. I really embrace it. Um, for me, it masculine and feminine talking about wine is, is something that that's evocative to me. So, and it means something to me. So for when I say feminine, I, I tend to mean that it is, maybe a lighter touch, um, you know, uh, wine that is, has often floral notes to it or delicacy in the fruit that the oak is integrated. It's an aromatically driven wine. The tannin is, might be there if it's a red wine, but it, it's, uh, it's integrated. So it's a wine that's mm. a little, maybe a little bit softer and prettier. And for me, masculine, I mean, I love, obviously I make Napa Cabernet. So I love, you know, wines that as they age get things like cigar box and, you know, tobacco and licorice and all that kind of stuff. But I also like the pretty side of wine. And I think that our, our portfolio, you're not going to find a lot of heavy handed wines in it. Right, 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 right. What is it that, you know, terms aside, it is a, there is a difference between those two wines, however you want to describe that. It, it is definitely different. I, I remember being in Napa with you guys recently and drinking you guys, you guys opened up one of your, it was a Barolo. It was not a, it was a Barolo. And it was so unbelievably approachable. It was incredibly floral. I couldn't believe it. And then I said, to, I said to Jonah, how do I get, you know, 
seven, eight, ten bottles of this. And he laughed at me. He's like, there just is no more. So, oh. and I'm like, why did you open this for me? Oh. It was it was one of these bottles that yeah. that you guys import a very small amount mm-hmm. and it's pretty mm-hmm. much spoken for when yeah, it gets I mean, there. I mean, the, you know, the neat thing about, you know, importing wine and, you know, we've had some producers that have allowed us to get some library wines from them, which has been great. That to me is like a a sign of great respect when we start to, you know, because normally you're just going through that annual cycle with the producer. This is the new vintage. You're going to get, you know, what the vintage, you know, brought you. But we've had some producers say, hey, we've, you know, we've got some something from the family seller that we can get you 10 six packs of. And that's been really, really fun. So, for example, we have 07 Barolo right now um, that we're bringing in that's really gorgeous. And yeah, we were actually bringing in just to taste with some clients, older Arnais from one of our other producers. It, I don't know if everybody listening knows that Arnais ages impeccably, which is one of the great Italian white wines. If you ask me the most underrated white wine in the world, I think Arnais would be one of the ones I would name. Fantastic. I, I, I truly believe, I mean, especially from a price point standpoint, it is incredible wine. Really, truly amazing. Yeah, yeah very um, evocative and and really, you know, can age and and it's just yeah, you write notes and notes and notes when you're tasting and smelling those wines. Yeah, I, I'm very skeptical of regions that do not have a white wine that is endemic and that they respect and love. And uh, I I think that when you go to Barolo and you drink a lot of these red wines and they're they're grippy and there's tannins and they they range all over the map. Somebody hands you an Arnais. And it's like, it's a gift from heaven. It's a wonderful glass of wine to, to have been given. And some are simple, some are very complex. It's, 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 a, it's a wine that I don't think America has, you know, gotten to experience in its full capacity. But I'm so happy to hear you say that because it is really, really a tremendous, tremendous grape. Absolutely. So let, let's, let's get into, I, I don't know, I don't know. You, you mentioned container ships. Yeah. I want to talk about the shitty side of actually having to sell a physical product. Yes. So COVID happened. Yeah. You are literally importing a product. It yes. comes on a container ship. What are you dealing with, with this supply chain stuff? With uh, I mean, yeah. I live in Los Angeles and there are container ships sitting right now all over the place outside in the ocean with nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting because first we had the headwinds of tariffs and that was a really tricky part. And that was, you know, pre-COVID Trump administration. Mm-hmm. And... You know, obviously the wine industry got caught up in something that had nothing to do with us and unfortunately penalized the, you know, the small guys, the independent business people and, you know, and the American consumer because uh, obviously all of those costs had to had to be borne somewhere. And importers were trying, you know, I think a lot of importers were trying to not um, pass on the cost of these tariffs. And uh, so they ended up obviously taking less margin. So there's there was a lot of pain and, of course, pain to the to the producers in Europe that that also, you know, had to struggle to, you know, some of us couldn't take as much wine because it was, you know, it was much more expensive. So tariffs were tricky um, and they were erratic. And so people, you know, a lot of the wine industry banded together. And I think that that was a really a unique thing about our industry that people were actually able to, you know, find a lot of common ground together and actually put, you know, work to it. Um, but uh, so tariffs started to obviously um, they they got frozen, and then at the same time, shipping started to get tricky. And some of this you can kind of you know predict, but at the same time, what's been interesting is that the port cha- the port issues. So most of the time, you're getting you know wine either brought over from Europe if you're importing European wine into the East Coast, or you're going through the Panama Canal and and bringing it to the West Coast. And sometimes over the last 12 to 18 months, there have been disruptions everywhere. So no matter, it's like a game of whack-a-mole, like, oh, okay, well, there's congestion in Oakland port. Maybe I'll bring it into New York and then truck it over, you know? And then there's a winter storm, you know, in New York and that delays things and you end up kind of, you know, horse trading on it. So um, up until now, Oakland port had been an issue and now it's Long Beach and Los Angeles, as you mentioned, Jason. And so Unfortunately, if you have a ship going to Oakland Port, which maybe has the space free, it still has to wait in Long Beach Port for three weeks with your wine on it. And then it goes up to Oakland Port. So sometimes they'll actually skip ports. You know, I I feel very lucky that I haven't had too many nightmares where, you know, I had promised a client something and, you know, everything fell apart because of a delay. But it's been, it's it's something you have to watch a lot and plan for. And so what you know, I think a lot of producers and importers have just kind of had to make adjustments. So what Jonah and I have done is that we're just bringing in wine faster. 
we're just saying, screw it. Like something that took three months now it might take four or six months. So let's just, let's just do it as fast as we can. So, so we're, and, and that's a cash flow thing for a lot of importers. It's like, you know, at some point you can't pre buy too many things too early either. So hopefully it'll get resolved, but they're saying that, you know, it'll last until next year at least. Yeah. I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. It's, uh, it's tricky. Are these containers refrigerated? Yeah. So, I mean, it is an optional thing in the business, but if you're bringing in fine wine, I would say that refrigerated containers are are the gold standard. So I work with a, a consolidator that that's all they do. You can't, you, you, I mean, I guess you could choose if you were bringing in very inexpensive wine during the winter, you could take, you can make that choice, but it seems very risky to me. Do you find yourself looking at meteorology? I mean, are you looking at weather? Are you guys, do you have GPS on the ships? I mean, I'm so curious as like, I want people listening to understand when you drink, and there are people out here who are just like, they love wines from Ribera Sacra in Spain and, you know, all these, all these sommeliers that I, I love and adore. But I don't think the people who drink these wines at the table or at a wine shop understand the pain in the ass it is to get here. The geopolitical situation, the politics, all this stuff. And two questions. One, did you know you were getting involved in all of these different topics when you got into this? And two, are you obsessive about it? Because that's the middle of the night. Are you looking on your phone at GPS of a of a container ship going through whatever, you know, Gibraltar or something. Yeah, we definitely, I mean, more recently, you're definitely watching ships. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's some great websites that you can see exactly where that boat is at any time, which is really, really cool. But if that boat is delayed for things that, I mean, you cannot control it. And you can't control it midway through either. You can't realize you made a mistake and how you moved the wine you know, midway. I mean, I, we didn't even talk. There were stri- there were a lot of strikes over the last few years in European ports too. So, you know, there were things, so many things that are out of your control. Like Anybody who's been to Europe knows most things are on strike at a given time. Yes. <laughs> yes. To, yeah, but it's just, been to France, a yeah. little in Greece. I so don't even get me started. I mean, my honeymoon basically, you know, oh. I was gas, gas people were on strike. The airplanes were on strike, you know, France, Italy, all this stuff. But it's also, you know, what do you do? Do you just, you, your stuff goes on there and you just throw your hands up and go, whatever, it'll get here when it gets here. Yeah. You have no influence. You can't do anything. No, I mean, I, it's interesting because we started our business in 16 and now obviously we're at the end of 2021. And, and uh, I mean, I would say I'm still learning in terms of just like how to, how to have the right amount of wine in the pipeline at any time, you know, and some of it, again, it, your, is, your producer may only, you know, let you pick up once a year and it's just that well, that's what you get. But then we have other producers where we're, figuring out, you know, how to not just in time it, because there's no, no such thing as just in time. I don't think in the wine industry, particularly over the last few years. So you just have to like figure out like what's the right pace to get things done at. And then always be vocal with your producers about wanting more wine if a wine's really successful and getting that wine on the water. So we work with a great consolidator named Lenteni Imports and they are great to work with, um, but they're also beholden to the bigger the bigger picture of things too. Um, but it's great because we can bring in fifty or hundred cases at a time, you know, of producers, and so we don't have to wait until something else gets built for us, you know. So, so for us, I mean, at this point, sometimes I would have said like, oh, I'd rather just have one or two or three ships to think about, you know. Now it's like, hey, you know what, <laughs> like just get it on the water, you know, and then we'll just have to follow through, you know, all the different chips. But, you know, again, it's just the part of the business that is behind the scenes. But at the same time, you're, you know, you're saying I, I sell, you know, I, I import wine, but I'm also selling it to clients that are counting on me. And so, you know, I'm thinking about what their needs are. And thankfully, there's no, there's no break between those two things, you know, so like, I'm feeling the pressure on both ends. And that's actually a good thing, in terms of just making sure you, you don't, you don't mess it up for anybody. Can I ask a stupid question? Yeah. Potentially stupid it's question? not stupid, Jason. There's no stupid. Oh, I promise you, I can do that. Um, why, are you not, why are you not importing barrels or larger containers? Why, from a carbon footprint standpoint alone, and also from a standpoint of just the fact of the cost of bottles, all the, you know, the weight for what the actual wine is, why not bring in stuff and bottle it here aside from the infrastructure needed. What yeah. can you do that? It's a good question. I actually, yeah, just spoke to someone who's planning to do that recently. There are options. I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it by any means, but 
For us, you know, I think the producers we're working with, you know, the way it works in in Burgundy and Piemonte mostly is that they're bottling and then they're going to label the shipment. So that's something that also I'm guessing a lot of people that are listening to us probably already know all of this, but you know, in those those No, this is this is this is, you know, it's it's not the normal thing, yeah. you know, that people are dealing with. I mean, but there's professionals that listen to the podcast for sure, and I love these people very much, but generally most people who drink wine are not selling it. Most people are drinking wine. And so this is not something they, they come across often. Yeah. And, and so like if you're drinking a California wine, most of the time that wine was bottled and labeled, capsuled and put in a branded case all at the same time. And, um, and that's because we have, you know, uh, that's historically the way it's always been, but also because of the way that we store the wines, you know, in environments where there's not humidity or any issues that way. And so, but in particularly in in Burgundy, I'll mention is that there's like a lot of humidity in the cellars. They're not the right conditions to keep labels on the bottles ahead of time. So they'll, you know, bottle the wine. It has a cork in it, but then I think all the rest of it happens later. And so they are preparing the order after we've placed the PO. That's when all of the extra packaging. And so that means we can choose whether the wine goes in a six pack or a 12 pack. And they have to put it on a special back label that has our importer information on it. You know, it's interesting because it makes me think about all the ways that like at the beginning, it felt very foreign to me, no pun intended, but like just learning how to get label approvals for each of the wines. And that felt very Herculean to me at the beginning. And now getting a, what they call COLA approval, it feels much more sort of, it's just a part of the the process is that you have to get government approval for each of the labels front and back before you can start bringing in the wine. And that means you can also make changes at some point into the back label too. So it's an interesting part of the business, but I've never really thought about bringing it over in bigger amounts. It does make sense from a carbon footprint, but I don't know if our producers, we never really addressed it with them, but I think they're primarily bottling when they're bottling and they're not they're not waiting to hold aside an extra quantity for you. Right, interesting. I, I think there's definitely uh, there's definitely something on the horizon we could do because, you know, I, I'm, I'm open as a consultant if you want me to. Well, to, I, <laughs> I, 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 I am sure to come that in you... have really bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> have you, have you, have you, let's talk about the, uh, just with the little, little bit of time we have left. Yeah. The actual, the actual sales of it all. Yeah. Have you ever imported a wine? You've imported a wine and you've put it up and it didn't sell. Yeah. Or it just exploded and you were like, what the hell? Yeah. I mean, give me some stories about how when you actually found a producer and it just didn't go the way you thought. Yeah, it definitely happens um, regularly that you, you you give your best guess of what are the right quantities to bring in. And obviously, depending on what the producer can provide as well. But it's like you go through all of these pieces where, you know, you have to make a bet four to six months in advance. Right. And especially now, it's like even during COVID, I was like, I have to buy totally blind because the market is behaving. You know, I'm doing most of my business on the retail wine shop side, a lot of times with Internet based retailers. And then in six or 12 months, it's going to go back maybe to more restaurants that are going to be catching back up and opening up and that sort of thing. So that that was kind of crazy. One, But like the most interesting recent one was that we are importing three new producers. The uh, One of them is, is uh, landing next week and they're based in the town of Verduno, which is an area that has a grape called Pella Verga planted. And there's only 14 producers of that grape. Well, they also, this producer also makes Barola Monvillero, which is like, you know, one of the the great single vineyard Barolos um, from the region. And so we're thinking, okay, well, everybody's going to be connected to the single vineyard Barolo. But when we bring up Pilla Verga, everyone's like, yep, sign me up. One one case of that, I, I definitely want that right away. And it's like, oh, we, we didn't bring in enough of this, the most unusual. It's because it's a, it's a beautiful ethereal red grape that has a lot of white pepper and spiciness to it. I, some of the people that are listening probably have, have had this wine before. But it's an unusual wine, and we thought maybe it was a wild card, and in the end, it's going to be the wine that we run out of first. Interesting. Anything that went bust that you were like, oh, crap, we couldn't sell it? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine you don't take big swings, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's um, there definitely are things that I've waited on. I, I, I have, for example, I'll, I'll be as transparent as I can. Um, I definitely have producers that make Nuit Saint-Georges and Pomar, which are eminently ageable red burgundies, but that that may be hard as nails right when they come young. So those are the wines that I put as far back in the warehouse winery cellar as I can and bring those out last. So I'm willing to have a little more patience with those wines so they show well. 
And the same is true for some, some Barolos, um, you know, that I just think that either that's a vintage that needs a little more time or that's a particular vineyard that often shows, you know, with a lot more tannin to it. So I'm willing to wait on some things, but some, they have to eventually come around because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm showing producers that people don't know as well. So it's like, you know, uh, you know, I, I can't, um, I, I'm not, I'm not showing something, I'm showing things that people don't know yet. So, you know, they have to be charming in some way they, you know, um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely been some things where I've said, you know, that didn't work and let's not bring the next vintage in. It just didn't resonate for whatever reason, or, you know, Jonah and I spend a lot of time thinking about the price points and are there some wines that compete in each producer's portfolio and kind of picking one horse instead of having three that might kind of seem the same in the market and that sort of thing. But there are some producers where we go really wide and we have only a small amount of each wine. And then there's some producers where we, we do pick two or three that we think are going to do really well. Um, but you know, we're always tweaking. That's great. And you, you guys work with some domestic wines, right? You work with Spotswood and others. So how do you import a wine where you are? Yeah. So we, um, we represent two Napa wineries and we represent two Oregon wineries as well. So we broker the wines of Spotswood Napa Valley in the state of California, except for the desert and an inland empire. We also represent our own wine called Pilcro. Jonah and I make single vineyard Cabernets. And then we represent Nicholas J, which is actually a Burgundy Meats Oregon producer that we're partners in. And they're based up in Willamette Valley and make beautiful Pinots and Chardonnays. And then we have Columbia Gorge producer, which Columbia Gorge is about 45 minutes east of Portland, an amazing appellation. And then the winery is called Idiot's Grace. And we bring in their Cab Franc. So beautiful up there. I love Columbia Gorge is one of those places. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Basically like all of these wine regions that we're talking about are places to go and drink wine and fall in love. Yeah, definitely. With the wine. <laughs> <laughs> and with each other. I don't know. And with each other. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, it, th- this is this is endlessly fascinating. I, I, I feel like, uh, you know, to get to the end of how the hell wine actually makes it into the country is not, it's not simple. There's no answer to that particular thing. Um, yeah, and there's, and there's lots of different importers. There's small and, and large and national and state specific. And what we do right now is we import into California, but we're starting to then partner with distributors in other states. So we import into California and now we, we partner with STEM in Arizona. And they're an amazing boutique distribution company in Arizona. And we're about to open Texas next. So there's there's interesting ways to sort of start to to grow your footprint, but do it in kind of a thoughtful way. But at this point, we don't have dreams of being a national importer, but it is something that, you know, there's there's a handful of them that are doing it amazingly well in the States. Incredible. So let's talk just last question here. Yeah. What region, what place do you want to go to next? If you it's could. Good question. If your question, Jason, is about importing wines from another region, I would say that we... Probably importing. Yeah, yeah, probably importing. For now, one of the things I think has made us successful is that we've chosen our lanes. So Burgundy and Piemonte are where we feel just like there's, we're still scratching the surface. There's still so much more to learn. There's so many amazing producers there, and we, we think there's still more a lot more opportunity. And so for us, it's like, there's other regions we we like, we're interested in, we're t- we're open to, but we're definitely like not opening that can of worms just yet. But like if you come to our house, like you'll see. We drink at home. You know, aged Napa Cabernet, great wines from Burgundy and Piemonte and and that's like 90% of it. Have you thought about any Greek reds? I know we're getting <laughs> off topic here, but I, I think there are some Greek reds that honestly, like I'd love to see hit the States that are very yeah. Barola like. I mean, yeah, I, it's, it's an interesting question. Like every, every portfolio, like if you're, if you're a buyer, if you're, you know, a restaurant buyer in California and maybe you're being called on by 50 wine vendors, you know, they have a lot of choice in who they do business with. And I think there are some importers that like specialize in certain regions that I think are, doing a great job. I can't, for me, it's like, I like being a little bit blue chip, but also kind of a champion of small to mid sized family owned, you know, farming focused families. And so for me, it's like, I don't know, I, if I start to get into three or four regions more, I feel like that's kind of dilutes our message a little bit and makes us a little sure. bit too much of a jack of all trades to the clients we call on. Like I already have to sure. decide between, okay, am I going to bring Napa Cabernet to you and Willamette Valley Pinot and Barolo Barbaresco, Arnais, red, white Burgundy, maybe a little bit of Cote Chalonnaise and some Gamay, you know, like there's, it, you can, you can easily get kind of lose your and dilute your message. 
Well, I'm going to talk to Jonah about importing Zeno Mavro okay. soon, and we'll see how that goes. But <laughs> I love it. Sarah, it is a it is a pleasure to have you on. I really appreciate it. It's uh, this Thank is a, you, a lesser a lesser discussed aspect, I think, of of what we drink, and it's also so important for people who really deeply care about wine. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's an endlessly fascinating topic. It's I think it's a case study kind of in the business of wine and you know, bringing, yeah, bringing the world together, I think, through wine. And, you know, it's, it's, I love it. I've, I've, I've enjoyed every minute of it and, and I hope to do it for the rest of my life for sure. All right. Well, listen, we will uh, get to know each other better by getting drunk together soon. And uh, I look forward to it. And, and right, wearing scarves behave. together. Oh, wearing scarves. I, I, I will help liquidate that and get you guys rich from Jonah's collection. All right. I will talk to you very soon, Sara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate it. Don't forget, Sparklers is airing every single week on SOMTV. SOMTV.com for the best culinary shows you can get. $49.99 for the year. This episode was produced by Nadine Netman and mixed by Alex McCourt. Everybody, holidays are building up. Have a great, great time. All right? Talk soon. Bye-bye.